1 Corinthians chapter 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Well, there's one of the qualifications for apostle. Are not ye my work in the Lord? The answer is all yes. Church in Corinthia, I started you. I am an apostle. I've seen Jesus Christ. I am free. I have free will. I can do whatever I want to do. He's been talking about that, the liberty. If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. God sealed it. So now you see what they're doing? Paul's not really an apostle. He couldn't be. This carnal church is messed up. In, and I think chapter 6 we saw that they were judging him. He said, you know, what do I need to be judged with you? God's my judge. Now you're judging my apostleship, my authority. My answer to them that do examine me is this. They're, they're looking at him. They're studying him. They're, who are you? What are you? Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, right, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? I mean, can't we guide them? Can't we show them what to do? Can't we help them? Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? We don't have to work. Now he's going to get into a great thing that is not found in churches and with sort of the economy that America has today, it would be hard to do this. And it looks like from what we go into next, it's not only that their, their question is apostleship is he's getting money from other churches to do his work, his missionary work. I know a missionary, I know an evangelist, he had health problems. And a lot, once he couldn't do it for a while, he had to rest, they just stopped giving money. That's wrong. I mean, even in workplaces today, they have things where, you know, you got a little bit of money coming to you, you got unemployment and stuff like that. But they're questioning, because look what he said, who goes a warfare anytime at his own charges? And are you going to buy your own? Is a soldier of the United States Army going to buy his own gun, his own ammunition, his own uh, clothes, his own tank? I don't think so. Who plants a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Okay, I'm going to go out and plant some tomato plants. You better be for sure I'm going to get some of them tomatoes before I give them away. And who... Feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock. Proverbs 27, 27. A shepherd will take part of the milk from the goats. I don't know if they're sheep milk. But he'd take part. That's part of his, his service to those animals. Say I these things as a man? Or saith not the law the same also? Uh-oh. Now we're not under the law. But look what Paul's going to do now. He's going to go quote the law. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Okay? So what you do is you would have an ox, he would work, he'd walk around, he'd step on the wheat. he thresh the wheat. And the thing is, he would not put anything on his mouth. If he wanted to put his mouth down while he's working and get some grain or... or we, he was allowed to. He was allowed to eat while he's working. If he didn't want anything to eat, he just did his job. The Bible says you are to do that. Let that animal feed by what he's working. Does God take care for oxen? Okay, the law said, hey, if that animal's doing a job, you pay that animal. The law says, if a man does a job, you're supposed to pay him. Or saith, he it altogether for our sakes, for our sakes, 
No doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth shall plow in hope. You go out there, you start plowing the field. What are you going to hope for? Whatever you have in mind to plant. You have in your mind the vision of a crop, a field of crops. And that he that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. So everyone that's involved with that crop is going to get the, the, the insight of the mind of the field. Hey, I'm going to get some of that food. Can't wait. Can't wait to make bread out of it. Can't wait to make a sandwich out of it. Can't wait to enjoy that. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Paul says, listen, we're giving you all spirit. We're giving you the gospel. We're giving what God has told us to tell you. We've shown you how to grow as babes. We've shown you what to do as Christians. Now, in return, as your ministers, as your apostles, as your pastors, and I'll bring it up to date for you. I need gasoline in my car, too, as your pastor. I can't go paying the bills. I can't run to the hospital to visit you. I can't, you know, come over and pray for you. I can't do uh, gasoline cause I forget what it costs. Two seventeen a gallon. Where am I going to get that money from? I need to study the Bible. Who's going to get me the books that I need to study the Bible? Who's going to give me the internet money for the internet time that I can do the study? Who's going to pay for the church to have electricity so we can have lights? So we can read our Bibles and see each other. While the preacher preaches the message about whatever the message is to, in our lives for the spiritualness, there are carnal things out there that need to be paid called electric, water, sewer, insurance, rent, or mortgage, whatever it is. Missionary is the same. Paul's really, he's an apostle and missionary. He, he needs help. I'm struggling right now with a tithing thing right now. I mean, I tithe. And nothing is free. In America, we got to have, oh, it's free. No, it's not. If your church, wherever climate you're going to be Sunday, if it's nice and warm where it's cold outside, or if it's nice and cold inside where it's terribly hot inside, that costs money. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Okay, now let's go back to the power. Have we not power to lead a sister, a wife? I can take care of my family. I can take care of my sister. I can take care of my, my, my children. I can take care of other apostles. But you got to help us. There are Bible-believing, proper, right churches with a pastor who is starving. Because the sheep won't or the goats won't give up the milk. When it comes time to shearing the sheep, they run away and hide. You can't get the wool to keep them warm. Oh, but when they want something, when they're out in the field, they're law, and now they want him to come find, come looking for him. Well, if he ain't got the gas money. And Paul is saying here to hinder the gospel. I'm not taking as much as I should take in because it would hinder the gospel. You're going to find out as we read through Paul's epistle, he works just as much as anybody else, especially with uh, Aquilius and Priscilla in tent making. He works. There are missionaries that go out there in the field and they work. With funds. Listen, the economy, if it keeps doing it, knows it, is going to hinder ministries. Now, I believe, I don't 
know if you really want to believe this or not, but as far as the con we're going to be going back, and the people are going to hate this word, but I'm going to say you, you may go back to home churches because what are you going to do if you can't afford gasoline? What are you going to do if all our jobs are lost to technology and you're not making a paycheck no more and you got to live off the government and the government will say, hey, we're going to tax you on how many miles you go or we want to know how many miles you need to go to work in a grocery store and that's all. What are you going to do? When the closest church you got is 5, 10, 20 miles away. You may not have opportunity in America to go freely to the church of your choice. Do ye not know that they which minister, take care of, help, provide, do about the holy things, this is going to the priest, live of the things of the temple? All those offerings that were brought into those Levites, many of them were the Levites. They kept it. They didn't have an inheritance in the land, but they were given land among the 12 tribes of Israel to have. And they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar. So when they did the service of God at the temple and what was brought as offering, that was their pay. So think about the priests. I'm trying to think, is it Nehemiah or Ezra? Or uh, I forget the nonprofit. The temple's being built, and then it stopped, and everybody's off working, and they're building their own homes, and the temple's not being built no more. What's going on here? Well, if the temple's not being worked and the temple work's not being done, well, the Levites ain't getting paid, so they gotta go get a secular job so they can make a living. And the secular, the secular job, you know, you got to work Sundays in, in, in America now. you got to have 24-7. And so you don't have time to go to church. You don't have time to bring the So, you know, it just overclasses you. That's wrong. There was a time in America like J.C. Penney, the owner of his department store, he would give his employees the day off for church. That's gone. And Paul's saying he's using the Old Testament. He's using the law to say, listen, those Levitical priests served the temple and they lived by the temple. Even so hath the Lord ordained, ordained, that's a word of the ministry, that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Well, that's interesting. So even so has the Lord ordained, capital L, has ordained, they that preach the gospel shall live off the gospel. Brother, I would hate to be a congregation standing at the judgment seat of Christ when you starved your pastor out. Because God said, I ordain. We ordain this man to be the pastor of our church. Well, God has ordained you to supply that pastor of your church. You know, one of the things they do if they don't like their pastor no more and they want to go more worldly, more carnally and all that, they will starve the pastor and his family out. And they will stand at a loss of the judgment seat of Christ. They that preach the gospel shall live of the gospel. what it says and there's a lot of phonies out there they go they, they get these artificial ordained papers they go to these rotten inky dinky uh, schools to get their title of, of doctor or minister or all that and they go live off the sheep they fleece the sheep they cut the sheep open and fry them on the frying pan but they don't minister though they will call themselves ministers and they don't do nothing for the flock you got the other side here. But here Paul's saying chapter 9 is that man that's in your pulpit, you're supposed to supply him. It's an ordained. But I have used none of these things. I, I haven't taken the money. Neither have I written these things to now. That it should be so done unto you for it were done 
Yeah, it should be so done unto you, unto me. So it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. Paul takes money, but then he doesn't take money. The church is too poor. The church of Thessalonica, man, they supply him well of what they can do. And then he's saying, make it for There's some church. Well, we gave Paul money, you know, everything in Paul was because of us. You see all the carnality in this? Somebody trying to do right, teaching right. Yeah, he, you know, he shouldn't be getting money. Well, look at all the money we give him. Uh, he's probably wasting it. You know, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessary is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul saying, listen, I preach the gospel because I want to. I don't have to preach it. I want to. Now, whether you're going to pay me or not, I'm going to preach the gospel. And as I preach the gospel in the street, I've gotten paid. I've gotten uh, bottles of water. I've had people force money upon us. I've people giving us fruit. And, and all kinds of, that's being paid for. The, that's God saying, hey, you're my minister. Enjoy. There are people go door knocking. Somebody will let them in the house, and then somebody will allow them, you know, give them a cup of coffee, a nice cold soda, or cookie, whatever. That's God paying you for the gospel. Take it, but don't go out asking for it. Don't go on the street preaching and having a little bucket there and ringing a bell saying, "Give us money because we're going to help you in the name of of uh, salvation." Don't go knock on it. Well, since we came to your door, this book here will be $1.95 plus shipping and handling because it took us to get here uh, $3.25. We're not to ask for it. But they're supposed to uh, give out. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessary is laid upon me. And people are going to die and go to hell. It's a necessity. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You know, I lose if I don't preach the gospel. Gospel tracks. We've uh, been in hospitals now for two, three weeks now, IV treatment. We get the gospel out, you know, you know and they treat us with respect. They help us. They like us. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. I'm going to knock on doors. Well, if I go knock on doors, the pastor's going to know it. They're not going to recognize me. I'm going to go with a, to the street corner. Hey, eh, no one really want to, but you know, that girl, you know, she's she's nice and all that. And I'll just go because she goes down there with it. That, that's not it. But if against and against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. You got to want to do. Go ye in all the world and preach. It says go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. But don't go. Have to do it. Do it because you want to do it. What is my reward then? What is the reward? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So people can't say, and I, I'm all for what you know. I don't know much about door knocking. I've done it. I don't know much. No one honestly can say that guy standing in the street corner in Daytona Beach, he just does it for the money. That would be an out loud, front loud lie.
because I don't take no collection. I don't take no money. I do it because I want to do it. No one could say he stands there and he screams at you because his church is making him do it. That's an outlaw right. So you see what, I, what I've done as far as my ministry of preaching the gospel is you can't say he has to and he's doing it for a specific reason besides trying to get people saved. Oh, I've seen someone give him a $5 bill. Yeah, but how often is that? And there are some people out there who do it just for money. You, you want to know who I'm talking about? A religious group? See them around every Christmas in front of Walmart. Ding, 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 ding. And how well are they? Excuse me, sir. What is Salvation Army? I don't know. Excuse me, sir. Can you tell me about William and Claire Booth? I don't know. Those people are there in the name of religion for money. And they're not doing nothing with the ministry. They don't know nothing about Jesus. They don't know nothing about salvation. Even though they hold a sign, Salvation Army, they don't know nothing. And they're doing exactly what Paul is telling us not to do. Yeah. And their origins were the, the, the defilest, scum-sucking people of England. And that's how the English people thought them. The drunkards. The, the, yeah, they the, wouldn't allow in the church. Yeah. He went to them. Went to them. And when you see those religion, it's a religion. Ringing their bells every Christmas. This is what Paul's saying. Don't you do. Now somebody will try to give me money. Like, no, 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 no. Like three or four times... And then I, I I usually will give in, or they'll pass it off to my wife or my daughter. Hey, you you give them that. But we're not we're not to do it for the money. But then you know what? I've had one. I, I thought about it one time. It was it was in Norwich, and the people from Dunkin' Donuts came out and gave me a. a it was the three of us. They gave us bottles of water free. And I thought about that verse in the Bible. It says, you know, if someone gives you a, a bottle of water and the prophet's reward. That's, that may be some of, you know, serving the Lord. Hey, I like what they're doing. Or what can I do to help? I can refresh them. I can help them, you know. But Paul ain't standing there with a kettle with a bell. And I think that's what this church is accusing them of. And today, you know, if, if I were to stand on the other side of that door, that, door, that bell ring, I would be the one yelled at. And if I chance stand there giving out gospel track, if somebody gave me a five dollar or a one dollar bill, they would yell at me for hoarding money. While that guy's over there with a bell ringing to get money for nothing. And I try to feed, feed you spiritually. Verse eleven. They're trying to get you money for carnality so you can get a turkey dinner. And maybe some cheap presents that will go with the fervent heat that Peter speaks about. Where I speak the spiritual thing that you can have a chance to go to glory before the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what is my payment from there? The Bible says gold, silver, precious stones, there are crowns to be earned. It's not about money. And so what's the biggest thing that Hollywood shows when you, when you, they, they have some kind of minister or a, a church thing like that? You know, the guy's got a gold teeth and a big Cadillac, and you know, he's all got all. And, what, you know, sorry, the modern church is like that. These people are on the television. Multi-billion dollar houses. They got their own helicopters. They got their own airplanes, their own limousines, and screwed in the people. And Paul is against Joel and all the rest of them. And I'd love to see that guy with the bright, smiley, white teeth. He makes his dentist a fortune preach one, two, a week or a month message on 1 Corinthians 9. Hi, everybody. God, this is so great. He give me 10. He'll give you a million. Preach out of 1 Corinthians 9, Joel. Or just shut up and close your Bible. Because it's not for the money. For though I be free from all men, 
Yet have I made myself a servant unto all men, that I might gain the more. Now free among, he does, no one owes him anything. He doesn't own anything. He's free. And I, I kind of look at these verses today with the medical industry. And I'm not free because of the medical industry. You can charge me with one target credit card. That's my fault. It's not that big. And then I got the car for, for fire stuff. All right, you can charge for me. But I've got quadruples more in medical bills that I... But Paul saying, listen, no one is giving me money. I am not talking by what they're paying me. I'm doing it out of a free will. And they gain more. And there's no restrictions. And yet you're to take care of your pastor, he said. Remember, an apostle is gone when the last apostles die. Once Peter, Paul, John, and all them died, there are no more apostles. They are a kind of weird group of people. We don't ever read about Peter going back to his, his family. He may have, I don't know. But they're missionaries, they're evangelists, they're church planners, and that's it. Man, there's rough of the group, rough lives. But when it comes to to the pastor, he says, you're to take care of him. That's what the law says. Me? You want to give me money? I'll take it. But I'll work if I have to. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made my, myself servant unto all. I'll, I'll help anybody. I will do a labor for somebody that I might gain the more. And there used to be an early part of the church too, the early Church of America. They would have people, they would travel church to church in search of work. They wouldn't be assigned in front of Walmart. They would come to this church and say, sir, listen, I'm a carpenter. I got my tools. Is there anybody in this church congregation needs steps fixed? They need a roof fixed or they, uh, a closet door or something? And I will do work if they will pay me to do that work. And once I'm done with all the work like that, and if you can show me to another church, and his ministry would be not preaching, maybe even preaching, but his ministry would go around helping people with their homes or their cars at a reasonable price and then move on. That would be his ministry. He wouldn't sharp change you like, you know, people work on cars today. And now we're going to get a little bit of thing here. On to the Jews, I became as a Jew. No pork. If the law said you didn't do it, but Paul, you didn't do it. If the law allowed Paul to do it, he would do it. Okay? But we're not under the law. There's freedom. But you're dealing with somebody who is under the law. So when you're dealing with a Catholic, you know, in love and charity, show him to call no man your father, but don't throw it in their face. Because that priest is their way to God as far as they believe. you got to use charity to show them and help them. That I might gain the Jew. He wasn't under the law, but he did what the Jews needed to do to be part of the Jew. So he can talk to them. So they will listen to him. You bad mouth a Catholic, he ain't going to listen to you. You bad mouth his church, he ain't going to listen to you. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. But we're, we're not under the law, he writes. That would be a contradiction of what he's written through his epistle. And it's not, he's saying, listen, I'm going to live the way they think they have to live, that I might bring them out. To them that are without the law, Gentiles, as without the law. Being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. So 
If they got no law, the Gentiles, but I got to live under God now. Now, this, now, get this. Get this. You got to get this. The Gentiles, they had no law, God's law. So Paul's not going to go over and fornicate and adultery and steal and all that because he has a law of Christ. He said, what's the problem? Well, why do you got to point that out? Because when we had an era in America called the hippies and the sickies, in the 60s, I like that, hippie, sickies, sixties, and they were smoking dope and all that, there would be men that would go out and get stoned with the hippies and the jippies. They were called Jesus freaks. And they will say, they will quote these verses. I'm going to be a hippie for Jesus to win the hippies. And Jesus would have never said get drunk or get get stoned that but under the law of Christ defaces them allowing to get stoned and work with the hippies became hippies themselves not taking showers and, and all the junk that they lived in and listen to all that rough rock and roll how Paul lived he lived under Christ he did not sin because they were sinners So that's an interesting thing. That I might gain them that are without the law. <coughs> so Paul reasoned with it. When, when he came to that, that statue, the unknown God, man, he preached to them the God. He came down to, okay, you got the unknown God, all these gods you have, but let me show you the God. To the weak became I as weak. That I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might all means save them. So, weak. Does that mean Paul fasted for 40 days and 40 nights so he could just barely move? No. He became, actually Paul, was, I mean, with all the things that Paul has gone through, he knew what it was to be with. He knew it was to suffer pain. I mean, he, he deal with somebody and he, he you know, open up his, he said, see, see those scars on my arm there? Yeah, I was whipped. I've been shipwrecked, my own people. He, he comes up, I'm sick now. My family, you know, talking to a Jew, my family doesn't want me no more. Oh. Let's sit down and have a talk, and I'll tell you about the Jewish family that I have. <laughs> they pulled me out of a bucket one day. Oh, really? Hey, they stole me one time that I died? Really? He sat in the side of that hospital bed. He said, oh, that's terrible. Oh, man, I can't imagine what you're going through. And he wouldn't lie to him either. Oh, I know what you're going through. I know what it's all about. If you don't, shut up. Just let them talk. And this I do for the gospel's sake. Look at that. That I might be partaker thereof with you. So there's many ways for the gospel. Listening. At hearing but it's definitely talking and not offending that we saw in chapter 8 like I said I use this illustration all the time I don't know if it's cruel or not but you can't be sitting at a table with a Jew and you're gonna witness Jesus Christ while you're eating a pork sandwich that guy is angry as anything you that I might be all men to be to save some, yeah. Because the main thing he's doing is, why is he becoming a Jew for the Jew? Why is he going under the law to be a law? Why is he not being under the law, but under Christ's law? Why is he becoming weak that he might get them saved? That's his purpose. And that would be even so for a Christian who's saved. 
We've read about, so far in these nine chapters, we've talked about weak Christians. They haven't grown. They're, they're retards. I'm using that as they will not grow. And he'll have to be with them to help them grow. And a lot of times, you know, the pastors, the, the problem with the congregation is that pastor will not get with them and meet with them and help them. That's part of his job, too, you know. That's part of the ministry. You know, when you're sick, you need somebody to, 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 hey, how you doing? Need anything? I'm praying for you. you. Need encouragement. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you, the Corinthians. So look what he's been doing with the Corinthians. He's been the Jews, the Gentiles, the weak in the church. This is what I've done for you guys. And this is, you're judging me. But you ever throws that in their face. Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all. Okay, if you're going to set out for a race, you're going to run, you're going to finish. That is your goal. But one, I'm going to show you where America ruins the Bible today. One receiveth a prize. Not in America. You got a re relay race of 10 kids. At the end of that race, today, all 10 kids will get a prize. And you may not even have to finish the race to get your prize. Paul says somebody is going to run that race and there's a prize to get to it. So run that ye may obtain. Run. Don't sit. Bible says go. Now he's going, he's calling you to action. He's calling the Corinthians, go, do, run. And every man that striveth for the mastery, ooh, get as best as you can at it, is temperate. Mellowed out, temper, temperature, in all things. That tribulation, that hope, the patience. That's what he's talking about. Listen, you run that rate. I, I'm going to, to witness on the streets about the gospel, for the gospel, for people to be saved. And that guy gets in your face. You're going to be temperate. You're not going to want to fight back. You're going to be patient. Though that may be one of your sins. And that guy one time, he just I got fed up. And not in anger. Listen, he was asking me a perfectly good question. And I was going across the street to answer his question. With no anger. Except for his part. And what that comes to is, guys, you know, that guy's asking a question. You know where the answer is in the Bible. Yes. See, I've gone to mastery. I know where things are in the Bible now. I need to know more things in the Bible to deal with particular people. But grow. Be ready, Peter says, to give someone that answer. Because you don't know. You may be passing on a gospel track. You may be with a street preacher. You may be with somebody knocking on the door. And they may turn to you and you may have to give them an answer. Grow. Be ready. That's mastery. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, a Heisman trophy, a gold medal, a bronze medal, or whatever. That's the world. But we an incorruptible crown. That's one of the five crowns we can earn. What is that incorruptible crown that we can earn? The day of your death or the day of the rapture, whichever happens first. You are serving God. You are doing the will of God. There's your incorruptible crown. As far as we know, demons will never get that. We don't told demons ever came back. Mark, at one point in his time, nope, you don't get it. And then Paul writes to us, yes. He's going to get it. Run that race. 
Keep going, because there is a crown there for you, incorruptible. They're saying, I'm not going to quit. Lord, I'm, I want to quit. I'm tired, Lord. But no. And the thing about the Lord Jesus Christ with those nail pierced hands, taking that crown and placing it upon your head. And then think about all the other failures who will not get this crown. Now, I don't know, we shouldn't be envy, we shouldn't be looking at things like that or anything. Well, isn't it? That many people are not going to get this crown? Go for it. Go for it. The same guy that doesn't like my preaching tells us that we are faithful every week to Amen. be. Now, wouldn't it be funny? Now, I don't know. I don't know how to judge it. But wouldn't it be funny to somehow, the, somehow the judgment seat of Christ, that, uh, that guy is what? Somebody, well, why should he get the incorruptible crown? You're here every Saturday. <laughs> Who said that? A man is dying going to hell as far as we know right now. Who has no peace? And what about so? Okay, I, I don't know. I, I believe my wife and my daughter are cheerful about it. I don't think they're grudging. Maybe sometimes sometimes I grudge about going downtown. I mean, I'm human. But we find the fact is, if as a family, three incorruptible crowns because as a family we serve the... Isn't that better? Not just one, but on a family that followed. I therefore so run. Paul said, <laughs> Paul's not, remember, he, he's been looking at Christian. Go, run, go, go, get that crown. I therefore so, now he's going to him. <laughs> I'm running. Forget you guys for a minute. I'm running. Now let's just come over to 2 Timothy chapter 4 real quick. Because this is so funny. Because 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Watch what he says. 2 Timothy 4, 6. And this is 66 AD. And we're in 59 AD in Corinthians by the date they're saying. So seven years later, this is what Paul says. First, 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but all to all them that love his appearance. Over here, when you're fighting this race, you're running. You're running. You want this crown. You want to succeed in your walk. And you say, Lord Jesus, come. I want to see Jesus. You got two crowns right there. Boom. You know what keep you going that race? At the finish line, it's Jesus. And at the finish line, it's Jesus. Oh, Lord, I don't, come on, come on, go, come on, get, I know, I know, struggle. Get on your knees and come. Lord, I want to come to you, I want to come to you. Lord, I see you, oh, come on. And you do, and you reach out and touch Jesus. Two crowns right there, there you go. How hard was that? How hard is that? A pretty hard one, but how how quick and how short you'd like to get those crowns? You know, if you want to see Jesus coming, you really believe that you'll get this incorruptible crown too. Because if you want to see Jesus, well, there's your focus. So where are you going to run? You're going to run to Jesus. There's two crowns for you to be earned, just like that. You keep your eyes. Now listen, I'm going through a battle right now. And it's, Sometimes I just want to quit. I'm tired of it. I'm fed up. But not with Jesus. Life is horrible. Life is not good. We're talking about that today with the nurse. But with Jesus, oh man, it's worth it all. Because don't forget, if I suffer with him, I'm also going to reign with him. So guess what? I get an incorruptible crown. I get a... What was it? That's an incorruptible crown. I get a... What was that other crown? I forgot the other crown. Crown of righteousness. Then I get the opportunity to reign with him in the millennium. How's that? There's three rewards for being faithful. Paul says, therefore, so I run. 
and then run back over to 2 Timothy 4, 6, and 7. He did run, and he did win. And in 2016, his words, even though he's died and gone off to be present with the Lord, his words are still saying, go, as Mark says. Wait a minute, Mark. Mark says, go ye on the world and preach the gospel. But Mark is the one that quit and came back. Did you notice that? Do we have a book called Demas? No. How's that one? What's the good news of Mark? The gospel? Good news? He kept going. He may stop, get going. You stop, get back up and go. The Lord hasn't come yet. You haven't died yet. Go. And therefore, so run not as uncertainly. He knows where he's going because he's aiming for Jesus. So fight I. Fight on. It's a battle. Armor. Look at that. Not as one that beateth the air. And you say, what's that one? Never see boxers when they're practicing and they're just hitting nothing. There's no punching back. They're just swinging a hand, you know. In the air and all that, or you see two guys are fighting and they're not hitting anybody. That's what that's what he's talking about. And when you just you know you just hitting air, there's there's nothing, there's no accomplishment. You're not doing nothing. You're just waving your arms, getting tired. So it is. It's like trying to get a fly. I, there we go. Try and get that fly. Fake the fake flight. Fake fight. Can't say that. Fake fight. You're not accomplishing anything like that. Uh, what am I accomplishing? There's Jesus. There's the road. There's the race. There's the crowns. There's the rain. Oh, I hate this world. And the closer you get to Jesus, the further you get away from the world. But, but, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. You got to say no. You got to say yes to things. Sugar not brought my body into subjection. Sugar has been the curse of my life of living today. If I had not been indulged in sugary stuff all my life, my fault. I can't blame anybody but myself. If I would have taken the doctor seriously all the years, that's where I fail. Least that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know, you don't want to be a failure. Well, who's the guy that led you to the Lord? Oh, he's, he's nothing today. I, don't, I haven't heard from him. He doesn't do what he's do, done. He's just... Nope. You got to tell the flesh, get back in that grave. And we're going. And even myself, you know... When I'm about to give it up, I forget what Paul and Jesus had to go through their own lives. <coughs> and many Christians in the Fox Book of Martyrs. I used to think, and I've got uh, more to myself than I should say, there's always someone that's suffering worse than I am. <laughs> but when you got pain, and you got bills, and you got situations. And you got in the world this takes you off God and Jesus. That's a funny. Well, you gotta look at the Lord and say, hey, it's yours. And then you take the reins back again. And the thing is, only thing I can say to you is is what Paul says. Get back on that track and race to Jesus. Because we believe he's coming. Mm -hmm. And he may come any second. He may not come in our lifetime. But even still, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, if Jesus doesn't come in my lifetime, I'm still watching for him, I'm still waiting for him, and the day I die, 
I'm still watching for him. Just because I died and go on a grave doesn't mean I lose that crown. It's Mark. He was waiting. You don't realize when we sin is when we take our eyes off Jesus. I know I got the answer for us to be completely sinless. I got the answer. I can't do it. If I focus my entire life, my entire being on God every single multi-second. If I can keep God in my heart every multi-second of the day, I won't sin. Problem is, I don't do that. I don't wake up first thing. You know, oh God, I wake up. Oh. I actually my first. Yeah, Lord God, you make that time a little feel like a little more hour more. Oh, our clock's gonna go off in fifteen minutes. Or I gotta go to bed. Yes. First thing ought to be God. And then when we sin, we are in the absence of God. When we sin, we're getting off the road. We're laying down the track. You think about whatever sport. Think, think about if we're in a football thing, at Super Bowl. Imagine, all right, they line up. The quarterback gets the ball. He throws the ball. The guy catches the ball, and he just sits down in the line right there. Just sits. And that's what we Christians do. We don't take that ball and go to the goal line. We stop, drop, and sit. And then wonder why everybody comes in and tackles us. Okay, go. Listen, if those worldly athletes can do it, or something is going to tinker and tanker when the firmament melts, why can't we do it for an incorruptible crown that will never fade away? Why can't we do it for the fact to say, I'm not going to be in New Jerusalem ball headed? When it comes time to cast that crown at Jesus, I want at least one to cast down at him. I guess that's a good thing to keep going.